Lake and why it's been given the title of most polluted lake in the United States. Joining me is Dr. Lisa Allure, noted limnologist and avid fisherwoman. Good morning, Mary. Augie, our very own lake monster, will be joining us live on location at his home, of course, via telephone. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning, Mary. Good morning, Augie. Augie, can you tell us what it's been like living in Onondaga Lake all these years? Well, Mary, as you know, I moved here in the 1500s from Scotland, and it was a great place to live. It was a meso-oleotrophic lake, there was enough to eat, hardly any humans. I spent my days lounging in the clear, cold water, gorging myself on my favorite food, delicious Lake Ondaro, Onondaga whitefish. In the 1700s, someone discovered that there were salt brines near Lake Onondaga, and since salt was in high demand, the factory was set up to process it for sale all over the country. And people began to move in the area and build homes on the shore of the lake and open businesses. But that's okay, because there's still plenty of fish to go around. Soon, the Erie Canal was built, and it became much easier to get here, so lots of people came to enjoy the natural beauty of the lake. And around 1884, the Solvay Processing Company set up a factory to produce soda ash. It seems people need lots of soda ash to make glass and detergents and chemicals and things, and all the raw materials you need to make it are right close by. The problem was that the Solvay process generated large amounts of waste, such as calcium, silicate, and carbon, carbonate, that either got discharged directly into the lake or were stored in these huge waste beds near the shore. I remember in 1943 when the dike holding back the waste failed. It threaded three square miles of the state fairgrounds. The rescue workers who waded into the waste flow to save people and animals had to be treated for chemical burns to their skin. Soon more factories opened up, like the Allied Chemical Corporation, and they produced a variety of organic chemicals, including chlorine, benzene, and caustic potash, and they too were discharging their waste into the lake. To make matters worse, some of them used mercury in their processes, and at one point, 22 pounds a day of mercury was being added to the lake. Lots of people moved into the area to work and live, and, but the problem was there was no means of uh, treating their waste, so it went right into the lake. The waste contained lots of phosphorus and ammonia, as well as harmful bacteria. The phosphorus from the sewage and watershed runoff became fertilizer for algae, so the lake, so the algae grew like crazy in the lake, died, sank to the bottom where it decomposed and used up most of the oxygen so that it was not left for the fish. In addition, that ammonia was also toxic to the fish, so the only ones that could survive were the type that could tolerate low oxygen and, and polluted water. And my beloved whitefish disappeared completely. And the fish that were left tasted real bad and upset my stomach. I could not even supplement my meager diet of fish with the occasional swimmer anymore because the water was so polluted, people wouldn't swim in it. By now, the city of Syracuse was getting quite big, and the city began the primary treatment of the sewage, which means they removed the solids, but it did little to protect the lake from chemical and nutrient pollution. The lake was a mess, and some say it was the most polluted lake in America, and that Lake Onondaga was also a major cause of pollution in Lake Ontario. I was ready, I, I was about ready to give up and move up north to live with my cousin Kelly at Lake St. Clair. Dr. Allure. Would you mind discussing some of the specific camp contaminants and their effects on the lake? Absolutely, Mary. Uh, traditionally, within the lake, there have been various pollutants, including mercury, alkali waste, ammonia, bacteria, phosphor phosphorus, and nitrogen in high levels. High phosphorus and nitrogen levels in the lake are caused by point source pollution, um, such as combined overflow systems, combined sewer overflow systems, which discharge untreated sewage into the lake and treated industrial and domestic wastewater that is released also directly into the lake. Um, from non-point sources, there's runoff and land applications. Phosphorus loading causes exil excess growth of algae, uh, as we in the business call algal blooms. Um, in Onondaga, throughout most of the summer, algae gives the water a cloudy green appearance and decreases the lake's clar clarity. Uh, most of the algae produced in the upper layers of Lake Onondaga ultimately settle to the bottom, where they consume oxygen in the decomposition process. The greater the algae production in the upper layers, the greater the loss of dissolved oxygen in the lower layers. One way to see the effects of phosphorus pollution is to measure the lake's water clarity. Uh, the New York State Health Department, um, their standard for opening a beach on Onondaga requires that the lake's clarity be four feet or greater throughout the summer. This is a matter of public safety, so that people can actually be seen within the water um, from 1970 to 1986, the lake's water clarity exceeded four feet um, only one day out of five, which is not very nice. Ammonia and nitrate are forms of nitrogen that in high concentration can be tox toxic to fish and other aquatic life. The effects of ammonia on water quality depends on a complex relationship among the amount of ammonia, pH, and temperature of the water. 
Uh, chronic exposure to elevated ammonia levels can reduce the, the natural fish spawning and restrict migration patterns. Combined sewer overflows create human risk because they add bacteria, floating trash, organic materials, heavy solids, and grit to city streams and to Lake Onondaga. Materials collect in vegetation along the banks and streams. It looks bad, it smells bad, and it can transmit disease to humans who may come in contact with the water. Materials on combined sewer overflows also deplete the dissolved, the dissolved oxygen in the water, and that's necessary for aquatic life. Uh, mercury is a metal that is found in a variety of forms. Methyl mercury, formed in aquatic systems, um, through, uh, is what's in Lake Onondaga. Uh, it's been found in the fish, on the flesh of the fish in Lake Onondaga in large numbers. Up until 1986, there was a lot of mercury dumping. The Honeywell Soda Ash Factory discharged an estimated 165,000 pounds from 1946 to 1970. That's why the lake's benthic sediments are considered hazardous waste. Recently, there was a study by Cask Lake, Williams, Harris, and McCready Waters published in Water, Air, and Soil Pollution about mercury-resistant bacteria. These bacteria combine with algae and prose form an epiphytic an epidic complex on the macrophytes. Sorry. Um, this is like a very tiny community of stuck to plants. The macrophytes provide nutrients for these tiny creatures, and we now know that the bacteria buffer the plant for mercury. Uh, these macrophytes appear healthy and have very low mercury, mercury levels, and they should be exhibiting symptoms, exhibiting symptoms of merc mercury toxicity, like bleaching and decreased growth. This doesn't mean that we can start dumping mercury in the lakes. Um, Bacteria is only present on some types of macrophyte, but it goes to show how the assemblage of biodiversity of living organisms in the lake is affected by anthropogenic inputs. These bacteria may be out competing other bacteria pros of algae in Lake Onondaga. We don't know. Many studies have shown that the mercury is absorbing to the sediments at extremely high levels and will be very difficult to remove. Wow, that's very interesting. Now, there's been some questions about the success of the remediation effort. Dr. Agar, what's being done, and is it working? Well, I checked the results from the South Deep Station this morning. Turbidity was sitting at 7 MTUs, pH was a steady 7.9. Uh, there was a chlorophyll spike from where it usually holds 2 to 3 milligrams a liter. Uh, it was at 11 milligrams a liter this morning. Dissolved oxygen is at 77% saturation from top to bottom of the lake. Mostly all indications of the eutrophic lake. Uh, the chlorophyll bloom is an indication of excess nutrients, but I would have to look into the matter further before I could pass judgment. Um, the removal of the soda, fash, soda ash factory on the lake was the best thing that ever happened. Uh, the factory had for years been used in the lake for waste disposal and had built solid, solid waste beds where soda ash waste was dumped. Um, the water in these beds dried up and a white chalky, chalky alkaline waste was left, which covered 300 feet of land. The dis discharge from these beds is increasing the lake's sal salinity. Um, Honeywell, the original owners, contributed $100 million, which they should, to help with the 15-year the lake, lake cleanup plan. These efforts are a collaboration between countries, state, and federal governments to remove the years of accumulated pollution from the lake. The plan for cleanup is to restore a healthier habitat along, within, and along the pollution, within and along the shore of the lake to make it a safer place for people and animals. This is to be done through various projects such as building better waste treatment facilities and reducing combined sewer overflows, monitoring the lake and its tributaries, removing contaminants within the lake, and we're also going to cap the lake. Uh, this is an exciting year coming up. Uh, there's plans waiting for government approval right now that outline some major construction activities for the year 2012, including construction of a new wastewater treatment plant, infrastructure to support the dredging and capping, capping activities that will follow, and construction of a pipeline for transportation of the dredged material out of there. Well, that sounds great. Things are really looking up. Augie, have you noticed any improvements in the lake? In the 1970s, things really started looking up. The federal government passed the Clean Water Act and the state banned phosphorus in detergents. The reduction in phosphorus in the lake has reduced the amount of algae and has increased oxygen level in the hypolimnium. This, combined with lower levels of ammonia, has made the lake environment more favorable for fish and they're beginning to come back. The lowering of ammonia in the lake water has also had an unexpected effect. Lake Onondaga had few, if any, zebra mussels in the past, and other lakes and rivers around us are infested with them. It seems that the mussels were very sensitive to the ammonia, so they didn't flourish here. Now they're moving in big time. And the result of the zebra mussels being filter feeders is that the walls of the, the waters are a little clearer. 
and the more rooted plants are growing deeper because the sunlight is penetrating further into the lake water. Some people don't like the zebra mussels and the weeds because it detracts from their enjoyment of the lake. But they don't bother me much, and, and the bass love the weeds. I'm encouraged by the fact that people are able to enjoy the lakes again, and I'm even more encouraged by the fact that I can gorge myself on the yummy walleye and bass that live there now. And I look forward to the day when Lake Onondaga is returned to its former glory. That sounds great, Augie. We are so glad you and Onondaga Lake are doing well. Dr. Allure, Augie, thanks for joining us here on Syracuse AM. Weather's coming up after the break. Thank you. Thank you.